test. Okay, so sorry about that. Didn't get audio on the on those. But so there's two real world cases that you can have here uh, from an offensive perspective. If you have created a piece of malware that you're going to use on a red team engagement, um, you are going to want to test that against a number of AV scanner engines and keep doing that until uh, it is not you know not caught by any of the AV scanners. Um, also. There's the, there is the, the defensive, from a defensive perspective, if you have uh, a binary or you have a file that you believe to be malicious, but that file might be a doc, it might be a PDF, and it might be targeted to your organization, you don't want that specific piece of malware to get out into the world. You don't want other organizations uh, you know, reverse engineering it and understanding that you might have been owned. You need to you do damage control. Uh, it may have uh, it may have sensitive information about your organization in it, so you don't want any of that to be disclosed out to you know just a website that you don't know who else is uh, looking at the data that's on there. So, uh, and I wanted to scare you into seeing exactly what a real world example of this use case is because. Uh, this is a, about a month and a half ago, I found a set of uh, files on one of those uh, online scanners. Uh, and these files were uh, all part of a family of malware called Ursniff. And so the Ursniff malware family searches your drives for PDFs. And it looks for just every PDF that you have on your hard drive. And it infects each one of them. Uh, it does, it, it, it changes them a bit so that it becomes, you know, the, the, the name of the PDF, uh, pdf.exe, so most people should notice that as like a little bit of a, a warning sign that there's something wrong with the PDF, but you'd be surprised, some people just don't, it doesn't click and, you know, and then they click it. So, uh, it infects every PDF that they, that it finds. And then you see the PDF that you thought was, uh, the, you know, some flyer or the instructions for your router or whatever like that. And you see the thing that you thought was the was a clean PDF. And then you email it to someone, uh, and then they receive it. And maybe something, you know, tips them off that they should probably send that to some online scanner engine. And so they upload it, and then you know game over. You can have, uh, you've just lost your, your data out to, you know, random people on the internet. So bad things can happen in that situation. And I wanted to give you a, a, an example of exactly how bad that can be. And these are, so I'm going to give you, re this, these are actually all redacted versions of some files that I have found on, uh, on, online. So, this is one which is just, this is a certificate of analysis of a chemical of some type. Um, and then there is a, the, the back of a check, uh, and it has, you know, some, some, uh, some, uh, company's information on there. Um, I don't know why someone would scan their checks and keep them on their hard drive. That's uh, a little baffling, but this is the, uh, this is the receipt for someone's car repair. Uh, you know, they went and, and had their, uh, they had their BMW X5 repaired, and this is the, uh, the, the bill for, uh, for all the repairs. Um, this is a packing list of something that was sent to some guy. Um, and then here is the front and the, the stubs for a check. Uh, this is another check. You know, you, you're getting the picture. You don't want this type of data to just get out into the world because who knows what people can do with that uh, and there's there's no reason for there's no reason for that to happen if you can keep it under control so uh, and also there, there's a couple of uh, there's a couple other projects that I wanted to kind of like point out and they 
you know, they do, th they, they basically create, uh, you know, malware that is uh, less detectable or undetectable. So Veil framework, I don't know if anyone's heard of this, uh, but um, I spoke at ShmooCon in January and one of the guys from Veil was speaking right after me and we talked, we chatted and they said that the, my project is basically something they've needed for a while and they were going to do it themselves, but now that I've got, you know, uh, code that I'm going to be releasing later today, you know, I think uh, they may actually uh, give me a little help. Um, so Backdoor Factory is another one where you take a binary um, and patch it to add uh, backdoors to it. So where did I come up with this idea? Uh, some of you may recognize this bar. This is uh, shutters at the Rio at DEF CON. This is not actually DEF CON. Those guys are not hackers. <laughs> um, but. This was where I came up with the idea with a uh, group of other people. Uh, during DEF CON, we were uh, bouncing ideas off of each other, and I realized that there was a, uh, a gap in the area of open source software that provides this type of capability, because you only have uh, online scanners, or you have you know, closed source, on-prem, uh, super expensive uh, scanners. So. Uh, it was just a ripe area for a project to be created. And so uh, one of the things I was trying to think about is why, why is it that no one had decided to create a project like this? And I think the, the only reason I could come up with is that uh, most people who are deep into open source software tend to shy away from closed source software. So they don't want to write something that basically orchestrates a whole lot of closed source software together. Um, it just doesn't, it's not the first thing that occurs to someone who's into open source software. But as a security person, this seems uh, uh, completely logical to me. So, uh, what are the basic plug scanner components? Um, and the list on the left, so I've given this talk a few times already and I've changed this slide a bit. So, the list on the left is the stuff that's in plug scanner and will be released today. The stuff on the right is stuff that I'm still. Uh, doing a little bit more work on, and I'm giving a talk next week in Paris on Plague Scanner, and hopefully I'll have a few more components from that side, which I can move over here for more code releases. Um, but the basic components, it's built with Python 3. Uh, all the modules that I use uh, are Python 3 modules. Um, the, the core of, the op the core of uh, Plague Scanner uses FreeBSD. Um, there are certain scanners that you know, don't have a FreeBSD version. So if they have a Linux version, I have to use Linux in that case. Um, some of the scanners are only Windows, so I have uh, Windows boxes at that uh, also. Um, and I use a combination of 0MQ and Nginx to transmit the jobs to, the, uh, to each one of the sc scanners. Um, and I'll go over why uh, in a minute when we get to, to uh, some later slides. But basically, I was uh, originally using 0MQ only. And it occurred to me that it's, uh, you know, 0MQ is not necessarily designed to transmit files, even though there is a, uh, there is a client uh, uh, file MQ. Um, so what I'm doing is using 0MQ to send the messages. And then I have an Nginx server with the malware on it, and then each one of the scanners picks up the malware using, uh, you know, just the HTTP uh, uh, get of that piece of malware. And so, you know, Nginx is designed to be very, very, very fast. And so it, it definitely cut uh, a lot of the problems out at that point. So uh, I use VirtualBox of virtualization. I was supporting QMU for a while, but I think uh, I just want to stick to one virtualization uh, one type of virtualization rather than supporting more than one. So I've chosen VirtualBox. Um, it has a feature called Page Fusion, uh, and that's a memory deduplication, and I'll get into that in a moment as well. Uh, my report format is JSON so that you'll be able to uh, ingest the report into just about anything that you can think of. Um, and then you can also throw it into Elasticsearch, MongoDB, any sort of uh, NoSQL database. Um, and then on the scanners, I'm using a Yapsi plugin system. And this is just basically to make it easy for an end user to create a plugin without having to really 
uh, know Python and code a lot of extra uh, components in Python that are outside of just the processing of that uh, uh, um, scanner. So there's an Elasticsearch uh, report, and this is basically taking the full JSON report and then jamming it into uh, Elasticsearch so that you could do visualizations using ELK. Um, and then the last part here is something I still haven't gotten to work yet, but it's uh, the um, OCR of uh, some of the scanners. Um, it is a really tough thing to get to work, um, and if anyone has any ideas for it, uh, I'm open for suggestions. Um, so the point is, you bring the scanners, so you have to go out and get the, these are closed source products, so you have to go and buy the licenses. I'm not involved with that. Um, I might even like have some, you know, some uh, lawyer's letter in the mail saying, hey, why are you reselling or, or getting involved with our product? So, no, you, you get the scanners, that's up to you. Um, same thing with the Windows licenses. Please make sure that, uh, just like any uh, malware analysis system, make sure you've paid for your licenses. Don't just use unlicensed uh, copies of Windows. Um, and then at the other side of it, we bring the plugins. So uh, the goal here is that I would like to have plugins for each uh, AV scanner engine so that I'm at least at parity with uh, the famous online scanner engines. Uh, so in previous talks I'd actually, uh, you know, from looking at lots and lots and lots of scanners, um, I had categorized them uh, previously into four categories and since my last talk at uh, B-Side Salt Lake I have actually uh, split them into five different types of scanners. So the first type of scanner is uh, open source, and there's only one, it's Clam AV. we all know that one. Um, and then the second type is a scanner that has uh, a Linux version, and if it has a Linux version or a BSD version or you know a Unix command line version, uh, it's very, very easy to uh, pull into and use the data and, and use the scanner in uh, Python and use the scanner in uh, uh, Plague Scanner. So, uh, the third type is a uh, Windows-only scanner. Uh, there's plenty of these. There's actually more of them than there are Linux uh, scanners. But this third category is a Windows-only scanner, but it has a command line so that you can, uh, you know, you can run, uh, you know, subprocess p open, subprocess call in Python, and call the binary and use it uh, just like you would one in Linux. Um, now the last two categories are the the really difficult ones. Um, so category four, these are the category of four and five are ones that I have just recently split into two separate categories. So uh, it's the type of scanner number four, which has a GUI, but they have coded the GUI properly so that it has so that it has uh, accessibility features. So if you're aware of Windows accessibility features, this is for, uh, you know, if you are blind, you need to be able to, uh, you know, uh, basically read with, a, with uh, you know, a Braille terminal or something like that, what's on the screen. And so the data that's in that pop-up window is, uh, you know, accessible uh, to them. So uh, number five, this category are, uh, the scanners that don't code that and just, you know, the, 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 uh, that, that information is not there. So, uh, category five are the ones that, uh, that I need to, to have, um, OCR for. So, OCR, like what, what are you talking about? Why optical character recognition? So, if a scanner is in that last category, there's no way for me to get the data out of that scanner other than taking a screenshot and then running OCR on it and then taking that data and then running the regexes on that. Um, so it's not 100% working, so what's my next option? So the next option here, and uh, this is something that I need, uh, do need help with because I'm not a Windows programmer by any means. Uh, so there's a program called inspect.exe, uh, and this is part of the Windows 8 SDK, uh, and you can find it in Windows 8.1 SDK. This is the one that I've actually pulled out. Um, and it lets you view any UI elements uh, accessibility data. So uh, at the point I'm at now, because I've been, uh, you know, recently started working on this, this feature, is I can see the data, I just need to know how to programmatically get to it. 
Um, so this is a screenshot of inspect.exe. And if you uh, select a uh, UI component like that, you get to see all of the, uh, you know, all of the accessibility data involved in that UI component. So how is my architecture designed? Um, it's actually super, super, super easy and super simple. Um, so up at the top, this is the submission processing and reporting um, node, if you will, and I'll show you all of this uh, you know, in a demo in a moment. Uh, the message queue in the center is uh, zero MQ, and so I, I'll go into detail about what the messages look like and uh, how they're constructed. Um, and then on the left, uh, oh, I'm sorry, on, on your right, uh, this is a Linux VM where I'm running the Windows VMs inside of it, and then each one of those uh, uh, VMs inside of it is running a bridged adapter so that from the perspective of the submission node, um, they all look like just, you know, nodes that it can send data and receive data from. Um, and then the Linux VMs, and each one of these has an agent which is tailored to the, um, which is tailored to the scanner that's installed there. Um, I'm working on this this component. I'm working on adding the the plugin, the Yapsi plugin manager, so that people don't have to remember which uh, agent to install on which one. They just install one package and it has all the plugins, and you know, uh, makes it much easier to install. Um, so, what are some of the really cool features here? So, as I said earlier, Page Fusion is a uh, feature of VirtualBox, and so. What it does is if you have uh, four VMs, all of them running Windows 8.1, uh, many, many of the memory pages are going to be exactly the same across all four of those VMs. And so why would the, the host, uh, the hypervisor, keep a, um, you know, the, the host operating system keep each one of those memory pages when they should only keep one and then have that shared across each one of the VMs? So that's what it does. And it allows you to run uh, quite a few different uh, VMs in one system and share all the same memory, uh, and not waste not waste a whole bunch of memory. So if you have uh, you know one gig one gig you've assigned one gig of memory to your VM and you've got four VMs, you're not going to take four gigs of memory for the host operating system. So that's pretty cool. Uh, zero MQ is a uh, very very fast message queuing. Um, I'm Pretty sure everyone's familiar with something like RabbitMQ, uh, but this is a this is just a little bit faster, and it's it has uh, no broker, so there's there's just the client server. There isn't like a broker that the message has to go through to get to its endpoint. Um, and then Elasticsearch, it's a uh, I mean it's a it's basically just a free text search uh, engine. You put data into it, and then you can index the data uh, and do searches and get back uh, uh, you know interesting, you know, emergent information about the, about the data, and then you can do visualization through Kibana. Um, so there's a few open issues that I have with the project. So uh, the first open issue is uh, Docker, and so I'm trying right now to get uh, the virus scanner engines, the Linux virus scanner engines, into Docker containers. And the reason for this is uh, to have them all run on one host rather than have them run on multiple hosts. So rather than wasting the resources of having multiple VMs, one for each, uh, one for each Linux-based scanner engine, uh, I would have one host and then a container, a Docker container for each of the scanner engines. Um, you know, basically reducing the amount of uh, overhead and resources involved. Um, I still need to get uh, OCR working. Um, and then also the, the core, uh, Plague Scanner core is just a script, so it runs, uh, sends out the messages, sends out the malware, waits for a response, uh, creates the JSON document, and then dumps it for you. So that is something I want to create a daemon, um, you know, in a similar way that like Cuckoo Sandbox where you can submit jobs to it and then you wait and then it'll, uh, you could submit multiple jobs to it. Um, and then, Another thing, uh, and I've had questions a lot about this, is uh, scanner updating. So scanner updating, there's just like the different types of scanners, um, scanner updating to make sure that things are updated and uh, you know that they're updated when you run it. It's actually very easy on the Linux side and Clam AV. I can, you know, I can use 
uh, Python to to deterministically know that that those are updated and include and I include the update and the version data in uh, the the JSON output of uh, Plague Scanner. So uh, those are easy. Uh, making sure that the Windows scanners are updated is a little bit more difficult, and this is an open problem. Just figuring out how to to make sure that all of the Windows scanners have updated themselves before something is run, or at least on a on a regular basis. Um, and then also one of the things I want to do is have uh, resubmission automation. Once I have a daemonized uh, uh, core, I want to have resubmission automation. And the reason for this is, let's say uh, you have a binary that is not detected at all. Uh, you know that it's malicious. You've begun reverse engineering it. You've begun doing further analysis on it. But you may not yet know what it is. So you would want to automate a resubmission You know, every uh, hour, every two hours, three hours, whatever it is, whatever you, your choice is, uh, so that when it is finally detected, you'll get uh, a result and you'll you might be able to, uh, you know, shortcut some of the some of the uh, malware analysis uh, uh, stages where you're trying to figure out like if it's a, a specific malware family, um, and you know the scanner will will give you a a, a hint as to which family it is. Uh, sometimes not. Uh, one of my one of my pet peeves with a lot of the scanners is uh, from. From the scanner company's perspective, because they're you know they're a business, they're trying to make money, so they're trying to reduce costs. And it appears that they uh, it appears that they would rather uh, have a generic uh, you know one generic uh, signature that kind of covers many malware families rather than having lots of smaller signatures that are tuned for one family. Um, I think developing lots of signatures when you're from that perspective, that's you know there's less cost for making a, a generic that covers more ground. Um, but for someone like me, I would rather have, you know, uh, a specific signature that tells me what family that is, or at least approximately what that is. Um, some of the scanner engines are good about that, like they're, they're very specific, and some of the scanner engines just come back, yeah, it's cryptic, this one is Zbot. <laughs> they're all cryptic or Zbot or generic. Um, so. Uh, those are not necessarily as valuable as other scanner uh, data. So uh, this this entry down here, uh, HP feeds. I don't know if anyone is familiar with HP feeds, but this is a publish subscribe protocol, uh, and the HP feeds. It's a HoneyNet HoneyNet project, which you are probably familiar with. Um, so H, what HP feeds does is it allows a instance of Plague Scanner or an instance of Thug, which is a uh, Honey client, uh, or an instance of Cuckoo Sandbox. Uh, it allows you, uh, as the person who's not running that, to subscribe to a feed of the data that's coming out of that Cuckoo Sandbox or that Thug instance or you know whatever the sand whatever the uh, um, uh, thing that's producing the data is. So you could maybe get a feed of binaries. Uh, you could get a feed of the, the uh, output data. Um, lots of different things that you can do. And then there's also a website. It's uh, called HP Friends. And it's sort of a Facebook-ish uh, social media kind of thing where everyone's a researcher and then you're trading your HP feeds connections with each other. Um, <laughs> So I want to. I, I would love to get an HP feeds uh, plugin output plugin in there. Um, and then last, lastly, uh, I you know if anyone is a Windows programmer, uh, let me know. I need help in that department um, because I need to get that the accessibility data out of the accessibility features and then into uh, um, basically just into text that I can process using Python. Um, so I want to just take a quick look under the hood and show you a little bit of the code that uh, that is running here. Um, this afternoon, uh, check out my GitHub site. Uh, at some point today, that I will have uh, done a push out there so you can see this yourself and hopefully start helping me with it. Um, but uh, one of the things I was kind of proud of was I actually got uh, threading to work finally. Um, threading is actually, you know, it. it it's fairly easy to do in Python, but sort of the the uh, the mental game of figuring out like 
what is threading really doing with my data and how are these interacting together? That can be a little bit more difficult than just a uh, linear, you know, serial uh, 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 script. So this is what I'm doing here. I've got a worker which uh, takes, so I have a, I have the, the, uh, the, the queue builder, which is actually off the screen at the bottom, but the queue builder just takes the, takes the uh, scanner's IP address, the scanner name, whether, you know, Bitdefender, ESET, uh, Clam AV, whatever, um, and then the port and creates a tuple, jams that in there as a, as a, a uh, item, an item in the queue, and then uh, the worker just pulls out the next one, pulls out the next one as the, as threads are created, um, and then sends it to this, uh, function here, send to scanner. So send to scanner takes scanner IP and file name, and then goes and creates the, um, it creates the, uh, the message that gets sent to, um, that gets sent to each one of the scanners, and then, uh, earlier before this, I'm actually, you know, taking, taking the file that, that we want to look at and creating a temp file in, in the directory that Nginx is sharing. Uh, and so, you know, while this is, while all of the threads are still running, uh, that file is available in, uh, in the, the directory in Nginx. And then as soon as all of the threads have, have come back and, and finished, um, the uh, that file is actually removed because I'm using uh, Python temp file. So as soon as I close, as soon as I close the file handle, um, Python itself cleans everything up. And it's all gone, so I don't have to worry about cleaning anything up myself. Um, and then this is the nginx booster that I was uh, mentioning. So this is where uh, I create the file uh, here using uh, temp file, and right here, that this is actually what I just just talked about. So this is where uh, we've got the file being uh, dropped into Nginx's, uh, you know, www directory, and then, <clears throat> uh, and that's the outbound samples directory up here, and then it generates, and uh, you know, I don't have to generate a random file name, so there's no way that anything can uh, will conflict with another file name because Python handles creating those random file names itself and making sure they're not going to collide, um, and then. Uh, as soon as down here, so this is where it, this is where the data gets jammed into the uh, the queue, the work queue, and then at the end of that, when the work queue is finished, after the after all the threads uh, have uh, hit the join method, uh, then I close that file handle, and then boom, everything's cleaned up, and I'm done, and then I'm dropping uh, the JSON document uh, into uh, the standard out. So. Uh, this is, and then this is from the other end, so these are on the nodes um, that the scanners are running on, and so this is the file scanner. Um, you know, I use subprocess popen. Uh, some of the scanners uh, will take piped input, so I'm able to uh, use uh, the communicate method for, uh, for subprocess popen and give it a uh, pipe data so that I never have to actually create a file on the file system. Um, I'm taking a uh, 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 bytes IO uh, object and then uh, reading from the bytes IO object and, and writing that data directly to standard in. Um, and so some of, the, some of them are able to do it that way, uh, some of them aren't, and so uh, this is one that is not, and so again, I'm using a temp file here uh, and so the temp file only exists during the time that the scanner is scanning it, and then when everything is done, when I close that file handle, it also cleans everything up. Um, for all of these, I have them, you know, so every, every scanner has some form of quarantine, uh, so I want to turn off quarantine, I don't want to like, you know, I don't want to uh, uh, have files just building up on the file system on the scanners, I want to keep the, you know, keep it easy to, to maintain. Um, so no cleaning, no quarantine, nothing like that. Um, and so then uh, once I've got that, I basically just have a pile of text, which is the uh, the, the scanner has told me, you know, lots of different information, like its version and uh, its name and, you know, who its children are and who its parents are and then what the malware is or what it isn't. <laughs> uh, a lot of times, you know, the scanner is not going to find what, it, what the malware is. And so... Uh, it'll just come back with none. Um, so, and this is this is the part which uh, you know takes a little fine tuning. Just going back and uh, 
uh, figuring out where in that blob of data is the stuff that I want and I want to carve out and like put into my uh, JSON document that's the final product of Plague Scanner. So I pull all that data out and there's a different uh, there's a different parse output uh, function for each scanner. So this is something that's uh, different for each scanner. And this is, the, this is what's going to live in the YAPSI plugin. Um, and so uh, I want to talk about the Plague Scanner message format. So 0MQ allows you to send a message to, uh, your, you know, to your subscribers, to uh, different sockets, like whatever, however you have it configured. And so I have it configured with a send uh, I'm sending a string, and so uh, the response that I'm getting back from the scanners is actually JSON. So I'm uh, I'm doing a uh, send JSON, receive JSON from the reply, but the the message going out, the request, is just a string, and I've kind of created my own uh, uh, notation here, um, you know, and it's a, the command scan. And uh, you know there will be a few more commands as I grow this uh, protocol, if you will. Um, but right now it's scan, and then you have the scanner name, and then at the end is the file name, and the file name is the temp file name that uh, that uh, Python has created and dropped into uh, the nginx uh, outbound uh, directory. So this is an example of that file name. Um, I just you know pulled this one from one that I was scanning last night. And so uh, the scan, Bitdefender, and then that is the temporary file name that was generated by Python. So let's do a demo. Uh, and I have, I, I didn't want to tempt the demo gods too much, but I do have a live, uh, as long as the network is running and still like being happy, I can connect to a live one. And I've got uh, malware uh, queued up here, so if you have any requests from malware that you want to scan, uh, let me know. But uh, I'm going to go with the uh, recorded demo first, just so we can see what it does. And I know that it's not going to you know, die on me or have a problem. So uh, this is just a very, whoop, this is a simple version of, uh, this is a simple, uh, you know, kind of reduced feature set of the whole thing. So on this side, this is the, this is the core. And this is where you run the plaguescanner.py script. Uh, and then these are, e these are three of the agents that are running over here, uh, just so that you can see um, you're, you wouldn't actually run them this way. Uh, but I'm running them this way, and I have a print command in there just to show you the, uh, the, the message as it arrives and what the message looks like. Um, and also, because uh, so if anyone has seen some of my previous presentations, you know, it's, it was serial. So, you know, it was just one, bum, 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 single threaded. And so we'd have to wait a while and I had to compress it. But you'll see now because of the threading, it's like, bam, and you'll see them all, uh, you'll see them all hit at the same time, which is pretty cool. So uh, the first binary that I'm going to uh, show you here is teamviewer.exe. Um, it's not teamviewer by the way. <laughs> so as you can see, it's scanning those, it's uh, being scanned. And then after a moment, uh, the slowest scanner is, the, is the, uh, the, 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 the one that's the problem. So as you can see, so ESET comes back and says uh, Alina OS dot F, uh, Bitdefender is like Zussi, which is like, that's like Zbot. They're like, <laughs> we don't care, it's, it's generic. Uh, and then Clam AV, awesome. They've got exactly what it is, Alina 3. So this is a point of sale malware uh, that I was working on last week. This is a fresh sample. Um, and this is actually, you know, it's a segue and for me to talk to you about the techniques that they're using. Um, so they, uh, a lot of the, the POS malware uh, um, kind of herders that are out there, um, the users of the malware, are using uh, credential phishing for things like log me in and team viewer and then they're using uh, team viewer and log me in and that sort of thing as the theme sort of the theme for how they get into your organization so you know things like find pos um, alina and so you know they're 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 kind of combining uh, rather than having a very targeted attack at some place where you can, where you know that there's point of sale malware, they're doing shotgun blast 
of spam and then hoping you know that that they're that the uh, the the binary that you uh, that you hit that they you know that they get to infect out there can then pivot and find malware I mean find a POS system that's on the the network that 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 it's gone to so um, and you know it's interesting that kind of technique I would think oh that's not going to work too well but you'd be surprised how many people have kind of uh, paused their POS. And then use the you know because it's uh, Windows POS software, and then they pop up a web browser, and then all of a sudden what, they're you know ah oh, I can read my email here because this is a you know this is a, a web browser, so they might be reading their email on you know a cash register system, which is not a good idea ever, <laughs> but you know it could happen, and so they're these people the the people that are behind these uh, these strains of malware are hoping for that type of mistake to happen. Um, so let's uh, keep going here. And the next one, the next one that we're going to do is, let's see. Um, ah, sample.exe. <laughs> so sample.exe, this one is a copy of Ursniff, one of the Ursniff examples that I went over earlier. Uh, the reason I called it sample.exe is because even the file name had information about that company that I wouldn't want you guys to even see here. So as you can see, it came back with uh, basically some nonsensical answers. It, nobody, nobody picked it out as Ursniff um, up here. ESET picked it out as cryptic. Uh, so if, you, if you're used to scanning things with uh, scanners and working in malware, uh, cryptic is another one of those generic. It's not actually cryptic. Um, so uh, here, and then uh, at least Bitdefender said, yeah, generic. We don't know, whatever. Um, and then this next one, 77kb.bin. Uh, there we go. So, and as you can see, it gets shot all to each one of the the scanners all at the same time, which uh, I was actually very proud of. I was like, ah, I got threading right finally. Um, so this one is a dropper. So you know, if they haven't been able to tell me exactly what it is. I'm getting back at least one generic here, but uh, they're telling me that it's a dropper. So this is good information. This means that I need to go. Uh, this means probably uh, the people that wrote this signature have watched it go either download a piece of malware and install it, or you know, basically pull it out of one of its resources, kind of pull the pull the malware out of its pocket and like install it on the system. So now I know when I go and do uh, an analysis of this binary, I need to look for another file that gets dropped. And so I need to figure out what that other file is. And that other file is typically a different malware family. So uh, you know, it could be dropping Zeus, probably. Uh, it could be dropping a, a POS malware. It could be dropping all kinds of things, Dire, uh, whatever. But at least I now know that this is a dropper, and I need to look for another file. Uh, next one. Remove watt226.rar. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't open or use anything that has rar as a file name anymore. <laughs> I, I think it's all malware by now. <laughs> um, so as you can see here, um, I don't know what this is, but uh, Clam AV has pulled it uh, as uh, hacktool.crack.wpa. So chances are this is not as malicious as other things. This is probably um, one of those gray area tools that uh, we all use every day, but get flagged as malware for some reason or not. You know, so uh, you know this would warrant a, maybe a bit more information. But it could mean that uh, you know it could mean that if you find this on one of your endpoints that you're you've got uh, you know a pen tester or an adversary that has gotten in and they're doing something live on that system. So who knows? Um, and then that's the end of my little video here. And I think we have like uh, five minutes left or so. And do we have any requests for malware? So I'm going to go over here to malware which is the uh, this is cuckoo this is an online version of cuckoo sandbox um, if you haven't heard of it go visit it it's uh, malwr 
um, uh, dot org or com. I'm in presentation mode, so I can't go see that. But um, I don't know any of these that you want to take a look at. Uh, any malware families you can think of. Any questions about uh, Plague Scanner? Uh, uh, no, I can. It's uh, it's Plague Scanner. Just type in Plague Scanner at GitHub, search for Plague Scanner, and uh, it'll be under the username Plague Scanner, and then the 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 project will be also Plague Scanner. I, you can't miss it. You'll see. You'll, the frog will be the. Cool. Awesome. I didn't even have to do any like search engine uh, fiddling for that. <laughs> It's a very good question. So one of the reasons why, uh, for you know, uh, here, uh, I had a you know, so uh, I have 15. Uh, I'm planning on releasing five today, and I'm going to release 10 more next week, uh, just because I'm giving a talk in Paris, and I wanted to have a little bit more code to release there, and not just get rid of all of it today. So, um, but yeah, there's 15 scanners. Um, they are the usual set. Um, uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember all of them, but you know, you've got AVG. I know AVG, Wind Defender, um, ESET, Bit Defender, Clam AV, um, Avast, um, uh, Viper, uh, and a few more. Uh, but yeah, so I want to. I, my goal is to have like the 50 plus that are, uh, you know, so I'm parity with all the other, um, you know, scanner banks. So at the moment, uh, that's a that that it it uses quite a lot of resources. So I'm assigning um, I've assigned one gig of memory to each one of the VMs, and so you know with kernel same page. Uh, sorry, that was what I was using before. With Page Fusion, um, the overhead. I mean, I, I have assigned it. Uh, you know, I've got a 16 gig. Uh, this this thing has 16 gigs, and you know. I am pushing it with uh, with having 16 gigs. So, um, yeah, that that's an area that I I do need to work on getting the the uh, the resources and and overhead uh, fixed. Right. So, so uh, the first question, which was uh, about, sorry, did you repeat? Uh, the first one was right. So uh, they don't. That's up to you. Um, you know, I of course, like any uh, any good programmer, I haven't gotten to the documentation yet. So, uh, but the documentation is going to be basically for the scanners. I'm going to basically link. And say, you know, follow, this is the version of the scanner that you need to use. Um, and if you want to use a different one, then just contribute the the code for how to instrument that one. But I'll point to the documentation. I'll at least help you find because some of the scanner engines don't have uh, the best documentation and located in the best places. So I'll make sure that you get to their documentation. Um, you know, I'll basically carry you to their documentation and say, if you follow this. When you are done following this set of instructions from them, you then begin with my set of instructions here. And then, uh, do you have to choose all of them? Uh, no. So let me give you uh, uh, that question I can answer best uh, by looking at uh, what's in here. So this is the configuration file. So. So here, you know, you I've got uh, Clam AV, Clam AV, ESET, and Bitdefender are the ones over here. And you know, essentially, the only thing you have to do to tell it to use or not use them is just comment out that section of the config file. So. Yes. 
So each endpoint uh, is a manual update if it is Windows. Uh, if it is Linux, uh, those are the Linux ones that I've got. Uh, I'm working on Komodo. Komodo's weird. Um, I've got it working, but it just doesn't have, I haven't found a piece of malware that it can find a, you know, a result for. So, <laughs> um, but, you know, all, so those all, I've got them, uh, you know, fixed up so that it makes sure that they're updated. Um, but the Windows ones, it's just uh, a lot of them just run on their own, and and you know they check on their own. So I have to figure out a way to to maybe force that or um... next question. Uh, okay, very good question. So the main reason for doing that is I'm hosting. So I have uh, my my um, you know cloud hosting is at Rackspace, um, and they're actually very nice to open source projects. They give you a, a, a budget every month of service, and so uh, the reason I'm doing that is uh, all of my scanners are on Windows 8.1, and there's no copy of Windows 8.1 that you can load from, uh, you know, it's not it's not one of the VM options at Rackspace. So I'm getting around that by uh, loading up one uh, one Linux VM, which is an option, and then having the, the, the Windows 8.1 VMs inside of it. Um, if you have a way to get a Windows 8.1 running on one of their uh, cloud instances, I think it's actually against the terms of service for the for workstation versions of Windows. But <laughs> next question. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>